With respect to biofuels, we've got four classes of plants we can talk about. We've got starch-rich plants, for example, corn, oil seeds, sugar-rich plants like uh, sugarcane and sugar beets, and so-called cellulosic biomass, which can be available either as residues from agriculture or forest products industries, uh, or uh, crops like, like grasses and short rotation trees. Well, there's a lot on this table, and that's part of the point. Often uh, energy is, exp is compared in different units per barrel, per gallon, per standard cubic foot, per ton. It's helpful, I think, to look at it in a consistent set of units. And you find, for example, that coal is by far the lowest uh, cost uh, energy out there, which we probably knew. Electricity is a rather dear place to begin a mobility chain at $11 per gigajoule. Uh, soy oil, which I'm not a particular fan of, uh, is one of the highest priced on here. Corn kernels are cheaper than oil, and cellulosic biomass is very inexpensive. In fact, uh, in terms of cost p per BTU, the purchase cost of cellulosic biomass is equivalent to oil at about $14 a barrel. So highly cost competitive. One of the other things we need to ask ourselves if we're going to look at using land and crops to produce liquid fuels is what kind of yield do we get per unit land area? And this, to, in my view, is the uh, fatal flaw, at least in the context of truly large-scale uh, petroleum displacement of uh, biodiesel and, for that matter, rapeseed. They produce very, very little uh, energy per liquid fuel compared to things we can do today, like converting corn kernels and also compared to things we can anticipate doing in the future, like converting cellulosic biomass to ethanol, but actually other liquid fuels would do as well. So without going through each of these objectives, different feedstocks are responsive to different objectives. And I'm not going to go through the whole color-coded uh, slide here, but there's virtual agreement, uh, or there is agreement amongst virtually everyone who's looked at it, I mean, cellulosic biomass is the focus of all studies for seeing very large-scale, widespread energy supply from plants, with the possible exception on a worldwide basis, not particularly relevant to the U.S. directly, that there are parts of the world that can grow large amounts of sugarcane, and uh, on this scale, the cellulosics are the preferred, followed by sugarcane, followed by starch, followed by oilseed. And so all biomass is not created equal from the point of view of uh, producing liquid fuels. So look, we have oil refining as, as the status quo. It's a remarkably efficient process. For 100 units of energy going in, almost 80% of those leave as liquid fuels, very little as petrochemicals. And you need to put in, depending on how you count it, 12 to 14 percent additional energy to make the wheel go round. And so we've been asking in the various projects I've been involved with, what might biomass refining look like? And in particular, I've been privileged to co-lead a project called The Role of Biomass in America's Energy Future. We focused on mature biomass conversion technology, technologies that we can't necessarily build yet, because from a public policy point of view, it's much more important to know where you can get than where you are in a particular technology path. This was led by Dartmouth and the Natural Resources Defense Council. We had uh, 10 or so fine institutions from around the country, and it was sponsored by the Department of Energy, the Energy Foundation, and the National Commission on Energy Policy. And so we looked at about 24 different advanced technology scenarios, of which only some are represented here. This is uh, looking at the percentage of the feedstock energy, heating value, that is yielded as products. The first two options are for dedicated power. Then we have Fisher Tropes fuels uh, combined with power. And then we have a variety of options producing ethanol. It could as well be butanol and would not be very different. Uh, combined with a number of byproducts, Fisher Tropes diesel, Fisher Tropes gasoline, uh, hydrogen, protein, power. We, we looked at a bunch of different scenarios. So the point is a lot of different processes that fall more or less into three different families. This is a complicated graph, but the idea is that we're following energy, initially 100 units of energy, through this particular scenario of a mature cellulosic biomass refining facility 
Of those 100 units of energy, about 54 would come out as ethanol. You won't get much more than that. It takes about 5% of the energy in the cellulosic biomass to grow it, transport it, store it, uh, uh, and, and have it present at the facility. But notice you've got about 14% uh, of that original energy coming back up here as power and steam, and you've got almost 40% of the energy leaving as residues, where you've still got chemical energy. The logical thing to do here is to process those residues by some non-biological technique, in this case providing all of the energy for the biological processing and substantial additional uh, product revenue and energy yield as well. If you get into the details, which we don't have time to, there's some wonderful sort of internal cogeneration here because the thermochemical processing is exothermic and the main energy needs over here are low temperature steam and so they fit together to produce remarkably high uh, overall thermodynamic efficiencies. Now, I don't want to do that. In terms of economics, uh, this is the price that you're selling into the fuel market calibrated up here in terms of dollars per barrel as well as wholesale gasoline price internal rate of return. The dedicated power options uh, are, have modest internal rates of return. The thermochemical fuel options without a biological step, uh, obviously their economics improve as the world is willing to pay more for fuel, but the ones that come out the best in this exercise are the biological options. If we take a more strategic perspective on that, here's the range of the dedicated power options, thermochemical fuels, and then these are combined, let's be clear, these are combined biological processing with thermochemical processing of the residues. And these, these if your th uh, hurdle rate is somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent range, these start to be competitive. And I remind you, these are projections for mature technologies. They start to be competitive at about $30 a barrel. And so part of what we were trying to look at was to answer whether, you know, to what extent one could, could expect or anticipate bright futures for uh, cellulosic uh, biofuels. From the point of view of economics, our exercise concluded one could anticipate a very bright future. In terms of greenhouse gas displacement, the, oh, there's a lot more similarity than differences here. It depends a bit what scenario you are comparing to, current, for example, displacing current power versus a potential future renewables power uh, intensive mix. But the point is that from a greenhouse gas emission displacement uh, point of view, the liquid fuel options uh, are more or less the same as the power option. You need to understand, of course, and I suspect most of you already do, that unless you spend a lot of fossil fuels making the wheel go round, that any process based on photosynthesis is a potentially sustainable carbon cycle. And many processes, in fact, come very close to realizing that, that potential. If you look at a different objective, petroleum displacement, uh, it turns out that we essentially use no petroleum in this country, extremely little to make power, and so you're really not going to have any effect on petroleum displacement if you make only power, and the, uh, the liquid fuel options that include a biological step give you the greatest petroleum displacement on a per ton basis. So some anticipated features of mature technology, about two dozen scenarios, broad range of products analyzed in a common framework, hasn't been done before. Many of these scenarios are over 70% efficient in terms of fuels and power, energy divided by feedstock uh, energy. Very profoundly positive fossil fuel displacement ratio on output versus input. In fact, a higher ratio than current petroleum processing. And integrated and biological, integrated biological and thermochemical processing is key. Uh, competitive, we anticipate, with gasoline produced from petroleum at about $30 a barrel, and attractive production and utilization cycles. Now, those are some of the things that I think are not the, the impediments, at least speaking in the long term. Let me describe to you where I think there are closer to impediments that need to be thought carefully about. You know, we have life cycle issues related to a particular energy option, and they're usually considered on a normalized basis, per ton, per mile, per acre. And in general, this family of processes scores extremely well on this basis. The Natural Resources Defense Council's summary assessment was several important potential benefits and no showstoppers. 
People who get excited about soil fertility uh, needs and solutions just jump up and down about the idea of incorporating perennial grasses into agricultural rotations, for example. But there's another set of issues, and I think this is a set of issues is more challenging. I refer to these as resource issues. The observation is that even with a positive effect per acre, an acre devoted to bioenergy production is no longer available, at least exclusively, for many other purposes. I think this is a greater challenge to biomass energy, and speaking broadly as opposed to what I happen to believe, I would have to say it's very much an unresolved challenge. I won't go through the list of all of these, but this is a bunch of extremely optimistic, um, well, I don't know if they're optimistic relative to reality, but they project a very, very large role for biomass energy. Let's just go to the bottom two, which are on a worldwide basis. You know, biomass becomes the largest energy source supporting humankind by a factor of two. This was quite a prominent study prepared for the Rio meeting, and the biomass potential worldwide is, total to, is comparable to total worldwide energy demand now. The problem is, I can show you an equally large set of studies which conclude about the opposite, just to pick a, you know, because of large land requirements, biofuels are not a long-term practical solution to our need for transportation fuels, and I could go through and read them, and you've probably read half of them already. So two questions come up here, it seems to me, that are obvious. One of them is, who's right? But the other one is, how can it be that about something that is sort of, how can people get such different ideas about something as basic as this? Well, the interesting thing is, the math is not the problem. There's only five variables in this equation. Um, the, uh, to, pr to calculate the net new land that's needed, how, how the vehicle miles traveled, the miles per gallon, the process yield, how much biomass you produce from other land uses, that's the I term, and the inverse biomass productivity. Now, look, if we all close our eyes and try to remember that equation, it still looks new to you, but I think you will agree it's very, very simple as these things go. So the math is not the problem. And we could talk a long time about this if we had time, but we did a simple exercise recently. We said, look, Let's go through and find the most favorable and least favorable values of each of these variables. So we did it for vehicle miles traveled, projected to 2050. We did it for miles per gallon. Clearly, we have the potential, according to David Friedman, we could drive a fleet of SUVs and, vehicle, uh, SUVs and pickup trucks and still get 50 miles per gallon with advanced uh, technology. I'm not saying that's what we ought to do, but I drove a, a vehicle here that got 50 miles per gallon. It's quite doable. Uh, you look at the process yield, which our studies project will inc be increased by roughly two and a half fold compared to uh, the current NREL design. Uh, I'd like to go into it in more detail, but there's tremendous scope for integrating biomass energy production into existing agricultural lands without decreasing food production. Um, and then finally, the actual productivity, this one parameter differs by a factor of 12. You roll through these, and since they're largely multiplicative, you get from essentially zero land required to satisfy the entire projected um, transportation uh, requirements of the United States. New, zero new land uh, to a ridiculous amount, 5 billion acres, when the lower 48 states is only uh, 1.9 billion acres. And so, uh, at least as an analytical exercise, we can reproduce the ranges of these rather than showing you just one more point estimate. And just to give you a notional sense, time is tight, but in a status quo scenario in this particular analysis, you need over a billion acres to meet current light duty uh, vehicle demand and advanced processing lowers that. Efficient vehicles and or increased pro plant productivity lowers it further. And from a combination of strategies involving integration into agriculture, you can get down very close to zero new land required for this very, very uh, large uh, demand for energy services. Now, there's a lot to this story, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, and I think this applies to more energy sources than biomass, and it's the point I want to leave you with, I think that it's not primarily a matter of facts which cause people to have such widely disparate estimates, or even we can reproduce here, from a ridiculously large amount of land to essentially zero. 
I think it involves, I mean, there's some, a matter, some matters of looking at facts and whether you're looking towards the future or looking towards the past. But more than anything, it, it involves what kind of world you think you're planning for. Too often, analyses of sustainability amount to saying, if we continue to make decisions as if sustainability didn't matter, would it happen anyway? And I actually think that question's a waste of time, and I think the answer is fairly obvious. I think what we need to be thinking about is, you know, uh, what are the paths by which we can get there? And so I will leave you with the following. Here are four approaches to energy planning and analysis. We can bury our heads in the sand, that's time honored. Uh, we can extrapolate current trends, the realist best friend. We can hope for a miracle, and I offer this particular paper in science, and if the author's in, in the audience, I apologize, but the basic outline, I think it's fair to say, is to acknowledge we've got big needs for energy, dismiss foreseeable options as inadequate to provide for the world's energy needs, and call for disruptive advances in entirely unforeseen new technologies. Or we can innovate and change. We can define sustainable futures based on mature but foreseeable technologies in combination with an assumed willingness of society to change. Frankly, if we're not willing to innovate and change, I'm an optimist, but I don't see how to solve these challenges. Or, uh, and then work backwards from there to the present. So on the one hand, scenarios such as the one I've shown you for biomass seem like they might be ridiculously improbable. Uh, you could make that argument. I haven't been talking about probability, I've been talking about possibility. But I would submit that all of the solutions that we're looking for, uh, or at least the most important ones, lie in category four, and that's been the category I've been trying to talk about. So one and two do not offer solutions. You cannot extrapolate the current non-sustainable, insecure present and get to a sustainable and secure future. I think it's physically impossible. Number three is great, let's hope for miracles, but it's a pretty tough baseline strategy and so I think that we're really, uh, we need to talk about strategies of the type of category four, and if they involve significant innovation and change, well, that's just the nature of the beast. Thank you very much.